Also, when I went to North Carolina, I got COVID. And then I started feeling better from COVID. And then now, I'm sick with something else. So I'm sorry if I'm a little nasally. Welcome back to the F the Sigma platform. So today, I wanted to really cover my personal experience with self-stigma. First off, our nonprofit, Fuck the Stigma, is a 501c3 nonprofit that aims to break the stigma surrounding mental health, substance use, and all other stigmatized topics. I'm the director of Stigma Breaking Content for this organization. I very much resonate with the philosophy of this nonprofit. So I did just recently go to visit family where I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I've been residing in California for about two and a half years now. When I moved here, like I just like I came and I didn't look back. I really didn't. I, <laughs> I almost never wanted to visit back home because I had all these negative ideas and bad memories with the city. And I was like, that city's the issue. But it was really just like the shit I was doing when I lived there, honestly. So, <laughs> so my intention with going to visit for the holidays was to change my perspective and to honestly connect with friends and family. And then it also had me thinking of the stigmas I faced living there. At first, I wanna cover what, what does stigma mean? What is stigma? So stigma is a set of negative beliefs and often unfair beliefs that society or a group of people have about something. So that's what stigma means on its own, but there's all these different types of stigma. There's systemic and there's self-stigma. The list goes on, but those are the main three. And self-stigma is like an internalization of negative stereotypes, which is the one that I mainly faced and the one that I resonate with. I don't think I've ever really walked into a place and I didn't get care that I needed because of my race or the way I looked. Even though I may have felt that way, that's when it becomes self-stigma, like I'm going to get discriminated for walking into this place. That would be my example, my personal example for self-stigma. I felt so different growing up because of these ideas that I was just putting on to myself. Nobody ever told me, Lysha, your hair is fucking ugly, you should straighten it. Or Lysha, you speak Spanish horribly, you should just never speak it again. Those were just all thoughts I was thinking about myself. No hate to Winston, but there's a main type of demographic there. And there's a main type of person there. And I felt like I didn't fit in. There was nothing ever wrong with the city itself, but I put all these negative ideas onto the city. Even though I'm the, I'm the one that was wreaking havoc on the city, always getting arrested, always breaking some sort of type of law, like it was me, I was the issue. <laughs> it was never it was never Winston-Salem that did anything wrong to me. They were just police officers doing their job, right? That even like boils down to like my high school experiences. Um, a little background on me. I'm a first generation Dominican. Both of my parents came from the Dominican Republic and started a life here in the United States. So I did grow up speaking Spanish. I have very, like, kinky, fluffy, black, curly hair. Spanish being my first language. And, like, over time, that slowly started to die down. No hate to the area I lived around or the people I went to school with, but it was just mainly people that didn't look like me. And that's okay. Like, there was, there's not an issue with that on its own. But it made me feel different. I allowed that to make me feel different. Like, I was like, whoa, wait, I don't look like these kids. Yes, there was some diversity. I wasn't the only, like, person of color at, at the school. But I just, like, I saw the majority of people and the people that were the most, like, popular or the most liked, and I wanted to be like them. So over time, my Spanish started slowing down. I would just start responding to my parents in English. I just wouldn't speak Spanish anymore. And then around third grade, I just started straightening my hair every day. And I like consistently, like I just wanted straight hair. I've been bleaching my hair for a very long time. So I, obviously I'm back to brown. I, I mean, this couldn't even be this deep. But part of me thinks it's like, maybe I'm just frying my hair for it to be straight. 
and frying it to be blonde and not own what the fuck my hair actually looks like. I'm telling you, dude, I don't know. It could be not not be that deep or it could be exactly what I just said. It was just a thought that went through my head because I, I just wanted to look like like somebody that wasn't me. I was ashamed of my race, my ethnicity, my native language. I just really wasn't about it. I don't know. Like I just wanted to not be Lysha anymore. And then again, this also, it all ties into me kind of acting like the shapeshifter of acting a certain way because I think you'll like me more if I say this or act like this and then ch switch up when I meet the next person, if that makes sense. And then a lot of that kind of just went on. And then I remember after years of barely even speaking Spanish, there was this girl who was like, oh, you're Hispanic. Like, let's talk, have a conversation in Spanish. I was like, okay. And I started speaking and she was like, dude, like what happened? Like you sp What's with this accent? Like, it was just like a whitewashed Spanish. Over time of like just not even speaking Spanish because of the shame of my culture, I truly started developing this accent where it's like, it, I sound like an American learning Spanish for the first time. And then that's when like somebody made a comment to me of like, wow, your Spanish sucks ass. It was only one comment ever, I think in my whole life. And I took that to heart and I was like, fuck that, I'm never speaking Spanish. And then I just started like adapting different cultures and I just wasn't like I remember I didn't even want to have people over because of the food we ate at home like now I fucking love the food it tastes delicious like like authentic Dominican food and I just like was ashamed of it even though I thought it was delicious it just wasn't what the people I hung around with ate and I just found it to be weird like this is how deep it went for me of just the true shame of my culture and nobody was telling me Lysha your culture is fucking weird. You should straighten your hair. You should not speak Spanish. Like this was all things I was pushing on myself. Nobody ever directly told me that. So that's, that was kind of the beginning of my experience with self stigma. And it was like tearing me down and like I was losing my identity and I didn't even know who I really was. And even, like, is my identity even my culture and my heritage? And it's this whole thing. And even today I have friends that, are like, Lysha, why don't you own this, like, that Dominican culture in you? And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I just felt so, I started detaching from it so long ago that it's hard to reconnect. Ugh, so that was, yeah, the beginning of my, the self-stigma. And then when I got into high school, dude, I hated my freshman year so fucking much. I had to transfer schools. Like, that's where I felt even more out of place than I did before. And even in that freshman year of high school, I started to experience depression and anxiety and, like, these things that I didn't even know how to identify at the time. I didn't know how to talk about that with people. It wasn't a conversation that ever... It wasn't a topic that was ever open and I didn't know how to talk about it and I didn't even know how to identify the things that I was feeling. So that made that extra hard. I remember times where I'm like bawling my eyes out in my room and my mom walks in and either asks me something and she sees me crying and she just slowly walks out of the room. And that didn't help with me wanting to talk about it with people because first off, I'm what 14 years old I don't know how to initiate this conversation of like mom like this is the way I feel and it just didn't help that she didn't acknowledge that you know things like that and yeah with anxiety I didn't even know that the things I was experiencing was anxiety like me my palms sweating or me feeling nauseous before like a social interaction. Like I didn't know that was anxiety. <laughs> Looking back in hindsight, I can identify what those things were, but it was just so hard for me to have that like open mental health conversation. And, and then that's when a year after that, that's when substances came in. That was my coping mechanism for my mental, the mental health struggles I was going through. And on top of that, so I covered the ethnicity things and then I covered the mental health some of the mental health things and then now addiction is getting tied into this and in myself like in this experience and yeah around like my freshman and sophomore year that's when I started experimenting with drugs and then inevitably getting addicted to drugs of course at first it was fun and you 
you wouldn't think or register that that was addiction because that's a normal thing of, you know, high school kids or college kids just experimenting with drugs. Like, it's a thing. But then it just became, like, really... I just started to get unhinged. I was out of control and doing it every single day. And I didn't know what addiction looked like. I didn't know what addiction was. So I didn't even know, like... (laughs) <laughs> that was a possibility for me <laughs> to become an addict or an alcoholic because I was obviously under this impression that I can stop whenever I want. And there was just no conversation about addiction or mental health. I didn't know what those things looked like or that that was a probability of me struggling with it because it's just like, why, how me, addiction, struggle with addiction? No way, I can stop when I want, even though in reality I couldn't, but I couldn't see it. So... And then I couldn't see myself as an addict because I had this idea of what an addict looked like. I was stigmatizing addicts even though that's what I was. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm not struggling with addiction. It's not real for me. Like, that's why a lot of people, I think, my opinion is that don't seek help because they almost can't admit that they're struggling with this thing because of this idea we all have about addiction. On another note, struggling with self-stigma was my sexuality. It's also not something I talk about very often. And I, I people have told me that before. Yeah, Elijah, you don't really talk about your sexuality much. And I don't know if it's a thing of because I'm ashamed of it still. Or if I just am choosing not to make it a part of my identity, it could be a little mix of both. I remember when I first started coming to terms of like, I might be a little gay. I only told, you know, I think I kept it like, I think I didn't tell anyone just for a few months when I actually like came to this realization and it clicked in my head a little bit. I told people, I was like, you can't tell anybody. This is like super like sealed records. You can't tell anybody top secret shit. And... I didn't openly tell people until like two years later, but like I think there's still some internal shame about it today. Just slightly, I don't know why or where. <laughs> I really don't want like my sexuality. I don't want a lot of things to be my the entirety of my identity, even when it comes to like oh being a recovering addict. Like I don't want that to be all of me. Like I don't want that to be exactly what I'm known for in the world or anything. I don't want to be known as like a lesbian or a bisexual or just like this sexuality label. Um, That's one of the reasons I feel like I don't talk about my sexuality much and also because sexuality is confusing and also because it's not like I'm not entirely super proud about being gay. It's fucking hard and annoying and frustrating and confusing it's all these things and it's fucking annoying i don't know so i think i am still struggling with the the stigma of being gay but not because i'm looking at it in a negative way just because it's so fucking uh i don't know <laughs> i don't know i also do this thing where it's like i don't tell people my sexuality maybe it's because i assume you kind of know And also maybe because I just don't want to open that conversation. Yeah, it's, you know, I feel like... (laughs) I think almost the conclusion of this is, to sum it up, is I've just been my biggest judge this whole time. And I feel like that's why I've struggled a lot. Maybe other people. I've just been been assassinating myself in my head of, like, I don't want to be seen as this lesbian. I don't want to be seen as this person struggling with addiction. I don't want to be seen as this person struggling with depression. Like, I don't want to be, or PTSD. Like, I don't want to be seen as any of these things because of the way society looks at these things. Moving this all back to Winston-Salem, when I visited family, like, it, it wasn't anything wrong with the city. It wasn't anything wrong with the people that were at my school or around town or whatever. It was just me and the way I was perceiving these things in a negative way. I was perceiving the city in a horrible way, even though it's beautiful. I was perceiving other people as like rude and mean and like you only, you think you're the best and blah, 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 blah. You're so egotistical. I don't know. Like it was just, I had all these ideas and 
all this shit in my head and it was all negative but it was just me hating on me and projecting in a way it was i was just projecting i think how i'm overcoming all of that now slowly but surely is acceptance acceptance of who i am acceptance of my culture like it, certain things about me i can't change i can't change the way like the addiction wiring in my brain i can't change the color of my skin i can't change the texture of my hair like those things were, I'm just gonna have to come to acceptance of and just own and appreciate. Part of me does wanna, you know, pick up, pick back up my Spanish, mainly because my parents still speak Spanish to me. And I think it would be nice to, you know, you know, have a dialogue in Spanish. It could just be also a super helpful tool, even though like you get paid more at jobs if you are bilingual. And I don't know, ugh, I'm telling you guys, I think <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> My biggest thing is just going to be acceptance of of who I am and the things I experience. I viewed the world as this very scary place for so long, and I don't want to look at it that way anymore. Like, I thought it was like the, me against the world, like everybody in the world itself and all these systems were out to get me when they're when they're not like the world. The world doesn't revolve around me. So, yeah, a big thing with me pushing through the self stigma was change of perspective and acceptance. But I think the moral of the story is I had a new experience with my hometown that I hated so much. And now I don't hate so much. I actually quite like it. I had a new experience with family, a new experience internally with myself and the way I viewed this town. And I don't know, I feel like I, I think I can finally say for myself, I've come a long way and I'm actually quite proud. So, you know, I'm still on this journey of not discriminating myself so much for who I am, but it, it, it's a process. So that's my experience with self stigma, what was going through my head, what it was like and how I'm pushing through now. I don't know. I think that I did okay.